And I was once in, I had an opportunity to speak with someone in a church, and, and I told them I believe in, in the millennium. See, they don't believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth. I said, I believe in that because the Bible teaches it. And, and I asked, why do you believe what you believe? And they said, well, that's what we've always believed. And that the, isn't that the, the, the normal? No, you get it figured out what you believe. You should know why you believe what you believe. Uh, you should understand uh, why you believe what you believe. You should have some understanding. I mean, these are things in the future, but uh, there's too much. You're going to see tonight. There is too much throughout the scriptures that teach that there's going to be a literal thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. It is not just in uh, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the millennium. Um, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting topic. Um, as you know, we've been talking about dispensationalism, and that's, that's a mouthful of a word, uh, but dispensationalism is just a way of dividing up the Bible and how God deals with man and how man often fails in his dealings with God. So far we've looked at innocence, conscience, government, promise, law, and the last one was grace. And grace is the age that we live in. We live in the age of grace as far as dispensationalism. So tonight we're going to look at the very first uh, dispensation that's in the future. It's the last dispensation. It's the only one left to take place. Um, so it's in the future for us. Now, people have different ideals on this idea of a millennium. Uh, <clears throat> there is the post-tribulation. There's four different views, uh, four different views of the millennium. Uh, the first one is the post-tribulation premillennialism. Now, that's another $5 word, uh, which basically means that they're thinking that from the age of the cross, the cross being the beginning of the last days, all the way up to here, they see us going through the tribulation. The church will go through the tribulation, and everybody, I, hope, I assume, knows what the rapture is. They believe the rapture will take place right before Jesus comes back, and we'll go up and we'll come back down just as soon as we went up. But then they believe that there will be a millennium that takes place. Catholic believes this. This is their ideal. If they have any eschatology, this is an eschatology that they would have. Eschatology meaning... Uh, a study of future things is what eschatology means. So the second one is the one I prescribe to, the one I believe the Bible teaches, pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism. And this has the rapture occurring before the tribulation takes place. And we'll show reasons for that in, in later lessons. Uh, but it takes place right here, and then there's this seven years of tribulation, and then the millennium takes place. This thousand year reign. That's what the millennium is. It's a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. But some people don't believe it's on the earth. I'll get to that in a minute too. Uh, Post-millennialism. Post-millennialism believes, and this, this, this idea kind of fell out of favor. Before, uh, it came in around the beginning of the 1900s. And they believed that eventually that the church was just going to do so much good and there were going to be so many good things happening in the church that we would just bring in the millennium. That, that things were just getting better and better. And when World War I and World War II began, that one kind of went downhill and <laughs> there's not very many uh, post-millennialists today. There's not very many of those. Uh, the next one is all millennialism. And you'd be surprised how many... Uh, prescribed this view in Tennessee churches. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a symbolic view of the millennium. It says there is this millennium, but uh, there's all, they've got all sorts of different symbolism. They take the whole book of Revelation and make it into symbolism. And I was once in, I had an opportunity to speak with someone in a church, and, and I told them I believe in, in the millennium. See, they don't believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth. I said, I believe in that because the Bible teaches it. And, and I asked, why do you believe what you believe? And they said, well, that's what we've always believed. And that the, isn't that the, the, the normal? No, you get it figured out what you believe. You should know why you believe what you believe. Uh, you should understand 
uh, why you believe what you believe. You should have some understanding. I mean, these are things in the future, but uh, there's too much. You're going to see tonight. There is too much throughout the Scriptures that teach that there's going to be a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. It is not just in uh, Revelation chapter 20, which a lot of people point to is Revelation chapter 20. Uh, <clears throat> so, to describe this day that's coming, uh, what have I told you that there is a day in the future coming when you will literally walk with David, you will walk with Moses, you will walk with Abraham, you'll be able to go visit them on this earth again. Abraham, Moses, uh, Elijah, Elisha, these people will be back on the earth once again. Uh, you will literally walk with the Old Testament saints on this earth. You will live in a glorified body for a thousand years. That's what's going to happen in the millennium for the people here who are saved at this point in time who will be raptured out. You will live for a thousand years in this millennium in a glorified body uh, like Jesus had when he resurrected from the dead. Uh, there will be normal people also living during that time like we are right now, just regular human beings. But we will be in our glorified state. Um, it's a day when you will reign over the world with Christ. You will reign with Him. Uh, you will reign with Christ. It will be the most perfect environment that you have ever been a part of in your entire life. Now all of this sounds either like science fiction or sound like somebody trying to call you into a cult, doesn't it? It does. When you, when you hear these things, you think, oh, that's crazy. That's wild. But when you study what the Bible teaches, all of these things are true. They're true. It's all there. And I believe this thing because it is all over the Bible once you see this. It is everywhere in the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament. You see it appearing over and over again. And when I, I spoke with this group before, I, they asked me, said, why do you believe in the millennium? I turned to Revelation chapter 20 in my Bible. And I read, uh, let's see. Well, I'm just going to read the whole chapter for you here. Revelation chapter 20. If you'll turn there in your Bibles for just a second. We're going to, have, we're going to read this passage because it's so important. And this is at, at the end. Christ has come. He has, he has wiped out uh, the, the rulers of the world in Armageddon. He has taken control of the earth. He wiped them out with the, the words of his mouth, the scripture says. And it says in Revelation 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for what? A thousand years. A thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the what? A thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And it says here, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So these are the people who, uh, some of them have come through the tribulation, the saints, and some of them are people that are in their glorified bodies. They've come back with Jesus Christ. You do know that when Christ returns to Armageddon, it says that we come with Him. We come with Him back uh, on horses. Thank Him that we don't have to fight because He fights them off with His Word. It says it's like a sword coming out of His mouth. But we come back with Him here. It goes on to say, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. That's all the lost souls and the people who will die during this, trip, this millennium. This is the first resurrection, it says. A lot of people have been taught there's only one resurrection, but it just said that was the first one, didn't it? Uh, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall what? Reign. Reign. That means to rule with him for how long? A thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, 
Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in in the of the earth, Gog and Magog. That's these, these two nations that will be known during that time as that. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breath of the earth. Now, can you imagine this? The most perfect environment. And mankind is rebelling in the most perfect environment under the most perfect rule by the most perfect king that you've ever known. But yet still, they reject his lordship. And that's something. Uh, I'm going to say here. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That was a quick push away from a big uprising, wasn't it? So it goes on to say, And the devil that deceived them was cast then into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Now, I left that part out in the, in the past chapter. The beast and the false prophet were always thrown into this lake of fire. They were already thrown into that. They're still living a thousand years later. So don't let anybody tell you that you go to hell and you burn up and that's it. No. It lasts just as long as heaven lasts. Eternity. So, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne. You heard of the great white throne judgment? This is where it's being told about. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. It's, it's God is there, and there ain't no place you can hide. That's what it's saying. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. So the dead from all of time have come back here. <clears throat> and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. All of them were cast into this thing called the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I say it, it. But, now, when you read that, people take that like that all millennials, they'll take that and say, well, that doesn't mean that. That means this. I have a... When, when the plain sense makes plain sense, let it make plain sense, right? I mean, this is what it says. This is the end of the book. This is how things are, are occurring. And, and there is more than just this chapter that shows that. What have I told you? That 500 to 530 years before Christ, the prophet Daniel also wrote about the millennium. The prophet Daniel also wrote about this time. Now, compared to what I just told you, in Daniel chapter 7, listen to the similarities of what this prophet, remember, 530 years beforehand, before Christ even comes to the earth, is, is describing what is supposed to happen after Christ returns to the earth for the second time. Now, did Daniel understand all of that? No. No, he didn't understand all of that, but God did. And who wrote this book? God. God, through, the, through men, he wrote, he wrote this book. That's uh, a supernaturally written book uh, through these men. But Daniel wrote these words down. He didn't understand them, but God revealed them to him. In Daniel chapter 7, and verse 11, listen to this. Now, he has been having this dream. He has seen all these different beasts that are all these different nations. And oh my goodness, when we get into we'll look into this later on. But he actually sees all of these different uh, nations of the world. And he, we can look back on history and we can actually see these nations that Daniel is talking about here actually taking place and taking power before, before this ever occurred. He's not writing it down like it already happened. He's writing it down in real time. But he gets to the last one here. And he talks about this, this horn, which I too much to explain tonight, but this horn is in a sense the Antichrist, the false prophet here. And he says here in Daniel 7, verse 11, listen to the mirror, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn, the Antichrist or false prophet spoke. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flames, the lake of fire. What happened to the beast and the false prophet I told you? They were thrown in the lake of fire. Verse 12, as concerning the rest of the beast, the rest of the nations of this world, remember, had their dominion taken away. They're not in control anymore. The millennium is the control of Christ, not the... Not the United States, not Russia, and all these different ones. They're not in control. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. 
By Revelation 20, you'll understand that that season and a time is a, a thousand years. And he says in verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Christ is going to come back at the end of the Armageddon. Just like that. He's going to come back in the clouds. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Is that not what I just told you is going to happen in Revelation 20? His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Christ's rule will never end. Once he takes control... It never ends. It goes on forever. It even goes past this dispensation into eternity. And which shall not pass away, it says, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Now think about that. See, it's not just in Revelation 20. It's not just there. It's all over the scriptures you see this taking place. Even Jesus spoke about it during his time on earth. Now, have you ever asked yourself, why is Jesus returning? Why is He coming back? You know, every Christian denomination says Jesus is coming back, but none of them exactly know why. He's just coming back, I guess. Just say hi, you know? How crazy is that? But this is, this is the... We, we don't want to know why things are. Um, when we talk about Jesus' return... We just don't ever discuss why he returns. Uh, Jesus mentioned his glorious return at his trial before the Sanhedrin. He's standing there in chains. And he's standing there in that trial. And the Sanhedrin, they've got him. This is the Jewish uh, high council, you might say. They've got him here. It's an illegal trial. They shouldn't even have him that time of night. They've got him tied up. They'll literally beat him down for what he's about to say. And one of the people look at him and they say, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, now there are people in these liberal churches that will tell you, Jesus never claimed to be God. Did He not just ask Him? Right here. Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. Right there is God. I am. What did Moses say His name was? I am. I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Isn't that Daniel? Isn't that Revelation 20? Isn't that Jesus saying, I'm the one who's coming back in the clouds of heaven? He was referring to His millennial kingdom when He taught His disciples to pray. How many of y'all been taught the Lord's Prayer? You know what ain't the Lord's Prayer? It's your prayer? <laughs> it isn't the Lord's Prayer, is it? It's the disciples' prayer, really. And at the end of that prayer, their prayer, they're asked to, to repeat this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is the millennial king? When his kingdom comes and his will will be done on earth, a real, literal earth as it is in heaven. You see how it's all over the scriptures? And, and to ask a man... To deny the millennium when he knows what it says is akin to heresy. It's akin to blasphemy to ask him to deny it, I think. Uh, but he goes on here to say, uh, there is a time when his will will be done here on earth. So, the Old Testament often refers to it in Psalms. I can't get into it tonight, but Psalm chapter 2 talks about uh, kiss the, the nations will have to kiss the sun lest he be angry. You ever heard that verse? Kiss the son lest he be angry in Psalm 2. Go back and look at that. You can only understand what that psalm is saying if you understand it that this millennial reign is going to take place. Isaiah talks about this. Micah talks about this. Yeah, you do, Micah. No, no. The prophet Micah. Micah talks about this. Zechariah talks about this. All of them are talking about this last dispensation which they really didn't even quite understand. We've got so much knowledge here today and yet... Like I said Sunday night, we could write damnation in the dust on our Bibles sometimes, I think, just in the world in, world in general. So, <clears throat> uh, there is coming a, a time of this millennial kingdom. It will be characterized by several different, different characteristics. Uh, first of all, it will be characterized as a time of peace. A time of perfect peace on the earth. Isaiah 11, 6-7 says this. Now, you don't have to go there tonight. I'm going to read them though. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Now, you ever seen that happen? 
a wolf and a lamb cozy enough together? And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fat lamb together. Can you see a calf and a lion snuggling up? And a little child shall lead them. A three-year-old will come along and lead these creatures along. And the cow and the bear shall feed. The young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. You see, there'll be a peace in nature. Here's something interesting. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the lion will lay down with the lamb. Did you know that? It doesn't say that. You can look long and hard. There is no place that talks about it. talks about the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Uh, so that's an interesting side note. You don't have to charge any more for that. <laughs> There's also a sense of a peace in government. A peace and government. Micah 4, 1 through 3. He's talking about this millennial kingdom as well. And, and he says, uh, but in the last days it shall come to pass. This is Micah talking 800 years before Christ. That the mountains of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. So he's saying that Christ is going to reign just like I'm going to tell you about Jerusalem. Like Revelation 20 says, and many nations shall come. Not just the Jewish nation. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go over to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Right here, all of the, the rule will come out of Jerusalem in that day. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they, listen to this. This next quote is written over the top of the United Nations building. They think they're going to bring this about. No, they're not. Christ will. He's the only one that can bring this about. It says, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So he will have complete peace. He'll have complete control. He will rule this world with a rod of iron. A rod of iron. He will have complete control and he will have to throw it from afar off. So there will be this peace in the government as well. Not only will there be peace, but there will be justice. Justice. Isaiah 11, 3-4 <coughs> tells this. Isaiah 11, 3-4. The day we're looking ahead to is something called a theocracy. You know what a theocracy is? That's where God is in control of everything. Right now, what do we live in? Anybody know? We're supposed to be living here in the United States. A democracy. That's right. Back during the time when the uh, Bible was translated and most of the time while it was, it was being written, they lived in a monarchy, didn't they? So there is this theocracy coming. This is what a theocracy looks like. It says, And shall make of him quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Nobody's going to get by with nothing in this day. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither approve after the hearing of his ears. This is God himself. He's not going to judge you by the sight of his eyes, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. His judgments will always be right. Always be right. Because it's God. Uh, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Remember that he talked about there's coming a time when the meek shall rule the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So, so there'll be just total justice during this time. There'll also be unity. Boy, couldn't we have that in our country today? Total unity with some of the things we see going around us. Uh, total unity. Isaiah 11.10 tells this, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Jesus is the root of Jesse, isn't he? Coming from David. Which shall stand for an ensign of the people. That's a banner. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. They'll come together under this one banner of Jesus Christ. There won't be like the Japanese flag and the Russia's flag or the American flag. They'll be God's flag. They'll come under one banner in that day. One banner. What? Now think about what I'm telling you, you all are going to live through. If you're saved individuals here tonight, you're going to live through this time that's coming ahead. Uh, it goes on to say, uh, it's time of great abundance. Abundance like you've never seen. Isaiah 35, uh, 1 through 2 tells us about this. Listen to it. Isaiah 35, 1 through 2. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall re rejoice. So these broken down, tore up places in our world where, where 
I, you know, nature and, and all these... Uh, take, for example, Chernobyl, where you have all this radiation everywhere. That's going to get cleaned up. All these things like that's going to be cleaned up. It says here, in those wilderness and solitary places, uh, they shall blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellent excellency of our God. So the desert, you're going to bloom in that day. I mean, it just, it just you can't get your mind around the abundance that will be there. Not only that abundance, but the healing. Oh, this is going to be great. No one is... I won't be sick. I'm, I'm teaching tonight and sick. I won't be sick. You won't be sick. There will be no disabilities whatsoever. I, Isaiah 35, 5-6 tells this. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. That's a deer. And the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. All disease and disability gone. Isn't that awesome? Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in this day? Righteousness. There will be incredible righteousness. Isaiah 35, 8 talks about the righteousness. It says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. There will be perfect righteousness in that day. Why? Because he'll rule them with a rod of iron. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. If you're a crook in that day, you're, you're in bad shape. He'll find you all right. He'll find you. <clears throat> all of these things, and finally there is this emotion of joy that will just continue to be. I thought about the Disney movies. You know how in all the Disney movies they have all of this, uh, they have the princesses and, and they, the little birds come flying. <laughs> it gives you that idea. It gives you the idea of the joy. That'll be walking around in that day. You know, I don't know if it'll be like Snow White now. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be like that. But but listen to what Isaiah 55, 12 says about it. It says, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. <laughs> so even, even the birds are going to be greeted in that day, ain't they? What a day this will be. And what will make it best of all? What will make it best of all? All you've ever had is the spiritual presence of Christ in your life. In that day, you'll have the literal physical presence of Christ in your life. Isaiah 16.5 tells us, In mercy shall the throne be established, and He shall sit upon it. He shall sit upon it in truth and in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment, judgment and hasting righteousness. Sitting there. Can you imagine that? That would be the number one vacation spot, wouldn't it? Go down and see the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. <laughs> Not only that, Satan's gone, folks. He got cast out for a thousand years. You don't have to worry about him in that day. Isn't that wonderful? Not having Him around during it. We've seen that in Revelation 20. Uh, next, Messiah Jesus will be the benevolent dictator ruling over the whole world. Now, a lot of times we say this next verse at Christmas time. But it ain't nothing about Christmas time. Isaiah chapter 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Oh, Christmas is over. That's the only two parts it is. And then it says, And the government shall be upon His shoulder." And His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from this henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God Himself is going to put all this in motion. That ain't about Christmas, folks. But oh, what a Christmas that'll be when He comes. Finally, the resurrected saints of all time will participate in the management of that government. We've seen that in Revelation chapter 20. How could man fail? How could He? It's perfect environment. It's like Eden again. How, and man knows what's coming to get him now. How could He fail in this perfect dispensation? And people have asked, why would God even allow this millennium to take place? What's the point in it? What's the point in it? 
to show how dumb we are, I think. Because even in this perfect, perfect environment, there'll be failure. There'll be failure. As we've looked over this, we've always talked about the stewards. The stewards. The stewards during this time will be the resurrected Old Testament saints, the glorified church, and the survivors of the tribulation and their descendants. There will be children born to the survivors of the tribulation and they'll have to make a decision about whether or not to follow Christ. Do you think it would have been any easier for you to make a decision to follow Christ if He was sitting there? You think it would? And yet there will be some people that will still, still make the decision not to follow Him even with Him sitting right in front of them. The period takes place from the second coming of Christ until the final rebellion, a period of 1,000 years. The period is 1,000 years. The responsibility, they just have to be obedient, remain undefiled, and worship the Lord Jesus. Zechariah 14.9 tells us this, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, and His name one. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? The failure. After Satan is loosed from the abyss, they got thrown into the pit, Sinful man will rebel one more time. We read that in Revelation 20, didn't we? And the judgment is fire from God and the great white throne judgment. The final judgment of the entire world. The entire world. Well, the question is asked after all of this, how will people be saved during the millennium? They'll be saved the same way that I've told you through every one of these dispensations. By grace, through faith. By grace through faith. Isaiah 66, 19 through 20 even seems to make the reference that, that the Lord Christ will send out missionaries to go to show the people the truth and train them and teach them during that time. Isaiah 66, uh, uh, 19 says this, And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish, Paul, and Luke that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan to the isles of far off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. So he's saying they'll go forth and tell about these things. <coughs> oh. <coughs> and goes out to say, goes on to say, Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of the host in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. They'll come to see him in that day. Thus saith the Lord, the, 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 thus saith the Lord of hosts. In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of out all of the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, "We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you." I want to go find out. I want to go see what's going on. What's changed the entire world around us? Uh, there's this idea uh, that, that, that people will grow to extreme age like they used to back during the, in Eden. In Isaiah 65, 20, it tells us, There shall no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die at a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. And the idea here, this is what some people think. We're not certain of this. But there'll be this age of accountability at 100 years old about whether or not you've decided to follow the Lord Christ. Because you'll probably live extreme age when God sets everything back in motion here uh, during this millennial time. Uh, so, those saved during the millennium will grow old and die, as people always have. Uh, but after that uh, millennium and, and Gog and Magog event, They'll be resurrected at that great white throne judgment along with all of the unsaved of all time. We read about that in Revelation 20. And I've heard this a lot. You'll not be at the great white throne judgment. You ever heard that? You'll not be at the great white throne judgment. Listen to this. Not everyone at the great white throne judgment is cast in the lake of fire. You hear me? What was that last verse I read when I first read Revelation 20? Only the unsaved are cast in the lake of fire. In Revelation 20, 15, it says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So here we are at the end of the millennium. All the world brought before Christ for this great final judgment. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Over all of time, 
Isn't that awesome? I mean, think about it. All of these things coming together. All of these things planned out before the history of the world. And you get to be a part of it. If you need to speak with someone about what was discussed in this sermon, you can find our phone number at our church's Facebook page. Or we would love for you to come meet us at one of our regular meetings in person. Sunrise is located directly off exit 23 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. We regularly meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for small group Bible studies and then at 10.50 a.m. for worship. We also meet Sunday evenings for worship at 6.30 p.m. and Wednesday nights for discipleship training at 6.30 p.m. We would love for your family to meet our family. And again, thank you for watching and sharing with others.